thanks for coming here. Uh, my name is Bahadir, and today I'm going to present you the data processing way uh, using Onyx. Like DJ Anastasia. <laughs> Could you please raise your hands if you use one of these technologies? I see how many people are dealing with the processing. So almost half of the people. So which is I guess it's a nice number. Onyx is good for real-time event event stream processing, continuous computation, ETL tasks. Uh, data transformation and MapReduce, as you know, in closure, and data ingestion, storage, medium transfer, and data cleaning. I think it's just uh, some of the ideas here. It's not all it can do, but it can do a lot of stuff. And at the end of the day, at the core, the Onyx is basically a data structures and simple functions. I guess this is kind of like a sound familiar to you if you are working with the closure. Try to you know minimize what's the abstractions, what are they? But before getting into Onyx, let's see what we have in our hand. First, start with Hadoop. It's basic word count example. And if you can clearly see the all the code that is necessary to do this task, it's quite a lot. It's just a word count. <laughs> I don't know if you agree, but this is kind of the pain that it started in the distributed programming. Let's see another alternative, or it's kind of like an addition on top of the Hadoop stack. It's a cascading library. And here you can see that it defines pipes and flow definitions, and then executes the flow. It's, it seems to be much more simpler than the Hadoop's raw way. But look at the, all the imports. It's not exactly this code's imports, but still the amount of things or abstractions that you need to understand to execute very simple tasks, it's just amazing. So the pain point will be something like this, I believe. Like, it's not a huge pain, but it's just, it's just there. Let's get into the closure world. Storm has been introduced a couple of years ago by Nathan Mars, and I guess he's one of the most popular guys in the closure world. And he kind of defined the bolts and the topology and kind of help us to do real-time streaming in a much more easier way. But take a, take a look at all the code that you need to, you know, <coughs> wrap your code around, that you need to define. You need to define it in a macro and then you have like all these bolt and execute and there's a prepare through it somewhere. It's just kind of a, yeah, your, makes your code dirty than it is. I mean, you can do the stuff, but are you really enjoying what you do? It's a bit tricky, right? It just takes time. Let's take a look at Spark. Spark is kind of a, probably one of the most hype technologies out there right now today. Lots of enterprise companies are now using Spark to do machine learning and all these kind of transformations. And I'm sorry for the Java developers that this is their API that they need to use. I don't know if you can actually read and understand this piece of code. But in Scala, it's much more simpler as long as you know what this underscore plus underscore in parentheses means. It works, but what's going on behind the scenes, I am not sure. It seems simple, but is it really simple? What are the abstractions behind it? Who knows? And Cascalog. Cascalog is on top of Hadoop. And there is uh, cascading, and on top of cascading, there is the cascolog. So cascolog kind of uh, you write cascolog related code, 
and then it's transformed and compiled into the cascading and then the Hadoop job. But as you can see, there are some weird characters here, which is like a question mark and a dash, and there is a, a smaller sign and a dash, and then you have these weird symbols here that some, the sentence is basically your data source. It's, it could be a list which converted into a line and then you tokenize the sentence and you have an aggregation function called count. You supply nothing but it just works somehow. Don't get me wrong, I really like Cascolog, by the way. It solves lots of problems that I don't need to deal with Hadoop or any kind of the other stuff that you already saw. But is it, is it easy? Is it fun to use? I'm not sure that you can do stuff, you can accomplish stuff, but the amount of knowledge you have to know beforehand, it's kind of staggering. And it just works is not a good answer most of the time that you know, you need to understand when you write more and more code, the more complexity you put into your application, it, the more mess it gets. It's just a spaghetti in a different way. And during this presentation, like when I'm trying to prepare the presentation, I search for Apache Spark word count and so MongoDB is actually advertising for Apache Spark. And as you know, MongoDB is internet scale Let's give an example about the word count with MongoDB as well, using JavaScript. I think there is nothing to say here. Let's get into Onyx. Well, before we get into the Onyx, I would like to warn you that if you are expecting a one line closure code that is going to solve the problem, you are wrong. It's not as simple as it is, but there is a good logic behind it. If you think about how you write your code, it's basically you need to think in this abstraction. You have an input, and then you need to split this input, and then count the words in it, and you basically write it or somewhere. In Onyx terminology, it's called a workflow. So you define your workflow. The catalog is where you describe your workflow items. You kind of uh, tell Onyx that it's a, for example, if you look at in, it's going to read values from a core async. <clears throat> and there's a batch size implemented. And then you will have a split sentence uh, work, which is basically going to call the split sentence method in your code base. And there will be a count function which is going to group your words. And then you will write it to another core async. Till here you have seen zero functions or zero calls to Onyx or I don't know, try to understand some deep configuration. It's, it's very simply defined. The next step is writing your bare minimum closure function. That's it. It's basically you are going to receive a map, and then you will do your processing, and then you will return map or list of maps. You can also put conditions between your workflow items and you don't need to declare it as within the functions or within the implementation. You can also say, you know, filter this if the value, for example, if a word starts with a B, drop it. Just don't care, don't send it to the next workflow item. You can also do it using the flow conditions. And the next concept in Onyx world is Windows and Triggers. Windows, are tri Windows and triggers are a nice way to do calculations. 
So the Onyx uh, makers are uh, kind of like seeing the, where the industry goes and try to come up with a you know, easier way to do calculations. So here is the example of the word count that we basically call Onyx own count function, as you can see on line 61. And the name of the, this window text is like a word counter. And the window key is based the, the event time that is going to look for the event time key within the data that you are supplying, which is at this scenario, it's going to be always something empty, and which means that it's only going to be a global. So it's a global count. The trigger function, it's, it's a nice way to debug or like realize what's going on with your counting or aggregations. So in this scenario, if you look at the trigger on, it says segment. Segment is basically each param parameter or each data set you are receiving on your function. So here you say in every five elements, trigger this and call the method here, dump window. So you can have a timer trigger, segment trigger like here, or you can have a punctuation trigger, watermark, and percentile. You can take a look at the documentation of Onyx, which is, by the way, one of the greatest documentations, I think. The next concept in Onyx is life cycles. Life cycles are a smart way to, to, deal, to deal with your, for example, connection pooling or feeding your data in your core asynchronous channels. So it's, you may think also like a, a middleware, where you kind of uh, ingest your data in and do, do, do the things that are not exactly related with your tasks, but things that are necessary. And at the end of the day, you have a job, and you have to execute this job. A job consists of all the things that I mentioned before. So you define your workflow, you define your catalog, you define your life cycles, windows, and triggers, and you give the one of the task schedulers, which is in this case a balanced scheduler, and you submit your job. Uh, by the way, please be careful about how many peers that is available on the cluster. If you don't have enough peers, your tasks won't be starting. The batch size parameter that you saw before, that if you supply a batch size more than one, Onyx is going to group your messages together and then you know, do a smart, uh, less operation about them. So you don't need to do, for example, if you are going to write into the database, you don't need to write the database one by one each record. You can do it in like 100 batches. So less connections, faster outputs. In the word count example, we were grouping the count by the keyword word. Here you can use a key, which in this case the group by key name. In our case, it's the word. And uh, another way could be you can run, you can call a function, and that function's output will be the the aggregation key. Let's take a look at an example about the fixed windows. I think when you are doing aggregations, uh, it's one of the quite a lot of used things that, let's say, uh, how many registrations has been happened between the noon and the nine o'clock, or nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. Any kind of a fixed window that you want to have, you can do the counts based on data. And here we specify which key we are going to do the uh, time window. Here we use the event time. So our data should contain an event time key. And Onyx is going to take a look at that key and going to place that data in one of the buckets. And then you will have a count. You can also do a sliding window. So the, let's say how many registration has been happened in the last 10 minutes. And then one minute later, you can ask the exact same question. And one minute later, you can ask the exact same question again and again. So Onyx is going to do the calculation for you. 
And here we define a range for 15 minutes and the sliding window, for example, five minutes. So here is the diagram so also that the, the windows are sliding in every five minutes and you have new numbers coming in. And the nice thing of the Onyx is that, the, that uh, it doesn't matter when the message arrives, it matters how you are gonna evaluate the data. And in this case, it's gonna look for the event time key within the data and that it's going to put that data into the correct bucket. And in, in our word count example, that it's a global count. So we don't care about when, the, when a word is arrived or not, or when the word has been realized. You know, we just wanna count the word, how many times has it occurred. There is also a session window possibility about, as you can imagine, it's like a user session, and users are doing an activity between some time period, and you can see you know, when these are like active uh, sessions available. It's one of the nice things, or nice features out of the box as well. So in word count, we do a count operation, but that's not the only uh, operation that uh, Onyx supports out of the box. You can do also you know, add segments, and then you can just debug or find out what are these segments. You can do some operation, min, max, average, pretty basic operations. As I mentioned before, Onyx is a masterless, masterless system. So there is no master that take care of all the, all the things. There are only peers, and these peers are aware of each other's, and each peer kind of uh, outputs what it is doing to using the boot, boot, uh, bookkeeper. And uh, in the middle of all these interactions, there is zookeeper kind of like taking care of all the important things that who is alive, what are they doing, but also peers are communicating with each other uh, using transport uh, layer called ARAM. Here is a node in the cluster that does a task. It, they can also refer it as a virtual pair as well. So you can think a machine as a, a peer, and in that machine there are like five running peers, which are at this scenario called virtual peers. There is the zookeeper in the middle, watch peers, and does a lot of stuff. And communication between the peers are done through Aaron. Aaron is a uh, is a framework. It's kind of like a library done by the same guys who does the, who does the LMX uh, disruptor. So it's quite uh, efficient and it's a nice, I think, addition to the the whole stacks. So it's kind of like a handles all the transfer of the segments. Segments are the piece of data that you know your functions are receiving. So peers are communicating with each other using this uh, platform. <coughs> the log. The log. I I think it's one of the most important abstractions that the distributed comp computing has been uh, on the spotlight for the last years. And you can think the log as a stream of events in Kafka, for example. So all these peers, there are like jobs that are submitted to the cluster, and each of each of those, those jobs has been translated into multiple tasks. So there are like peers waiting to do uh, stuff in in the idle state, and whenever a job is uh, received and translated into tasks, then peer kind of like try to figure out, hey, you know, I want to do this, okay. Here is your segment, let's do something. So whenever it kind of completes the jobs, it writes it to the log, say, I completed the segment, here is the IDs, here is what I did, and you can get a lot of information from this log. Since there is no master, there is nobody forcing peers to take care of the tasks task actually asks to do the tasks. Like, okay, I am, I, am, I am available right now. I want to do something. Here is a task for you to complete. 
there are different types of schedulers that is available. Uh, first one is greedy, that you know when I, when that job has been submitted, all the platform has been focused on that specific ta on this specific job. That's it. After that ta uh, after that job is complete, then the next next job could be complete. And there is also the balance and the percentage. I think it's pretty straightforward. You can also uh, define how the uh, tasks are going to be scheduled. As you can imagine that if you read a file, and if that file is comp containing like 10,000 of lines, each of those 10,000 lines should be processed, which means that there will be 10,000 segments, and all of these segments are going to be distributed into the, into the peers. So it's very important that you do kind of like right selections on these uh, scheduling jobs. You can also uh, assign behaviors to each peers. For example, a peer could be marked as a datomic peer, so all the datomic related operations could be uh, routed to the same peer so that you, know, you don't need to pay hundreds of licenses for the, the peers that are running in your cluster. You could have like a 10 peers which contains the datomic licensing and the transactor, and those will be only assigned to do the datomic related tasks. And you can also think about like a special hardware, like let's say like some of the machines has huge memory, and you, you are going to do like crazy calculations. You can as tag those uh, peers as well. <clears throat> One of the uh, also nice things about Onyx is out of the box, you have uh, nice plugins that you know, uh, Kafka is there, Datomic is there, Redis is there, SQL is there, Bookkeeper. You can sequentially read from files. That's what the Onyx sec does. Uh, there's also the durable queue, which you can use your local storage, uh, and also the Elasticsearch. When you think about like distributed processing, you are probably going to work with the logs. Like there's some kind of a ID and there is a, a, a kind of a data that needs to be processed. So when you think about oh, it, with this data that you have different bits and pieces to extract, you know, find more information about, for example, like IP to country lookup or kind of a parse the user agent or figure out what the time of the event has been happened and what kind of a uh, event is this. So in this kind of a workflow, we, we define the input. In this case, input was a file. And then we parse the line. The, the, the left part was the here. You see there's a huge number which was, in our scenario, is a uh, Kinesis uh, generated ID. And then we have the JSON payload. At the first step, we parse the line. After we parse the line, we parse the payload data from payload data to a special selector that we, want, we don't want to process everything. We want to maybe process some of it. And then from selector, we can do, uh, write our data into uh, Redis in this example. So here is the definition of the uh, workflow in our code base. In this scenario, we are using the sequential plugin to read from a file. And it's kind of a type input. We want to use checkpoint, checkpointing in this file. And 
the next definition is a parse line, which we tell Onyx that, hey, this is a function that I write, so I want you to call to process the data. And the next one is the, the parse data. So what happens is basically parse line, whenever it's run, it creates segments. And these segments are uh, funneled to the next one, which in our workflow definition was the parse data, which is also another closure function. And then we have another function afterwards. And at last we prepare, we put our segments into the shape that we want uh, in a Redis format. and write all the results to Redis using the Redis plugin. But at the same time, we can also use a, a core async to uh, sh uh, send that data to our core asynchronous channel as well. Let's take a look at what those functions are doing. The first one was the, the parse data. In this uh, scenario, I kind of uh, parse the string, and after that parse operation, I also try to extract the IP address, and within the definitions here, I try to extract as much as data as possible, or the ones that I really care about, and user agent parsing, URL parsing, and a country. The parse line was the first method. What the parse line does was basically, you know, get the first 56 characters from our line. And the next part is basically, the rest will be the payload, which will be parsed by the get parse method. Here, selector does actually nothing. You know, selector just, sometimes we want to log the data in a, in a one in a thousand, and just do nothing. And as the last step that, you know, uh, Redis plugin wants to have a specific format, so we just give one segment to this function, and this segments actually return multiple segments as an end result uh, to write into the uh, Redis. And uh, Redis uh, operations wants to have like a op keyword, so what's the operation that we are going to apply to Redis, and uh, what are the arguments. So if you define the workflow of items, how the data is going to flow. But as I mentioned before, that you know we can use flow conditions to say if we are transitioning from uh, a method to an, another, we can write a predicate to say, for example, if my payload, the event is a page view event, then you can navigate or you can put it to the selector. If not, the message will be dropped. Here is a nice way to, without you know, cluttering our code base, we can filter out stuff. But it's also not only like filtering out, we can also tell Onyx how to behave when there are exception happens. For example, here we have a post transform method in the line 10. We say, call the substitute segment method and then execute it. Here, for example, if you look at the if you look at the predicate at the line 17, we say we have a function which, by denoting the the second column, say it's a local function, say event of, and then pass the variable which is at line 16 as the page view. So whenever this uh, flow condition executed, it passes the value here. And I, ju I just check here if the event name is expected event. So you can reuse the same function by just specifying different parameters in the flow condition definition. And here at the line 18, you can also use uh, and or not or uh, conditions in the just the map definition to figure out if this flow condition is going to execute or not.
as I mentioned, uh, life cycles are where we kind of uh, uh, do the uh, tricky parts. Here, I define the, uh, the life cycle uh, with uh, the first one is the, the in, which is basically we are going to read from a file. For, 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 for here, we define which file it is. And then you say, okay, uh, this is the right line definition at line 67 that uh, I just want to use the, the out calls and uh, all the tricky bits and pieces here uh, done at the upper parts, say, before a task starts at the line 50, inject in the reader, so we are preparing the, all the core asynchronous, uh, core async channels related stuff to say, okay, start reading from here and then funnel to the next task. Onyx is going to take care before the task starts actually. Here we define the other functions. These are some of the utility functions. So uh, as you can see overall that we are really writing like minimum Onyx related code. You don't even call most of the methods or there is not that much methods to call in Onyx. We are basically defining maps and lists and how these things are going to be combined together and then define the functions and then give this complete map to Onyx to actually run. I am trying to find out the actual executor. Of course, it's jobs. The starting job or executing job is combining everything together here <coughs> at the line 28, starting from 29, 28. Say, these, these are my workflows. These are my life cycles. These are my flow conditions. And all the windows that I want to execute and triggers. And I want to use a balanced. So, Onyx, please does the job, and that's it. <laughs> sure. Is this easily readable right now? Okay. So we just passed the, the all the definitions, the all the, the an ontology that we created to Onyx to actually does the job for us. <coughs> So here, uh, all these uh, in-memory in catalog related at the line 23 that we try to combine all the, if it's, if it's kind of a, a, a development task we want to use as the core asynchronous as much as possible. But in a production environment, we are going to switch, of course, like Kafka or you know, write it to the database. So we basically nicely switch over that if we want to use the core async related stuff like as simple as possible in our local environment or if you are on production we can switch all these to back to normal default states. Where did the, can you help me with, oh. what shall I leave to you? Oh, here, okay. When you start to make things as simple as it is, if you still agree they are simple, you can put all these definitions into anywhere you want. You can just put all the definitions into the database and then read it from database on the application load and start submitting tasks without anybody changing the code, which actually enables a lot of end users without knowing any programming language to config, configure this stuff. It might be a crazy idea, so it sounds like a crazy idea, but you know, 
that's what the enterprise guys in the Hadoop world does. When they have all these, you know, installations, and when things are getting more and more and more advanced, when they have more functions, they try to, you know, get the developer out of the way. But in order to do that, that they need to write a lot of, you know, combining code. But in Onyx, it's much more easier because that's the the core philosophy from the design. And at the end of the day, if you are not enjoying the experience, what's the whole deal? That we need to have fun while working with the technology. That Hadoop, Cascalog, Storm, Kafka, all these technologies, they have huge amount of abstractions that you need to understand. But I hope to actually describe you all the Onyx's core uh, concepts here. And I don't think it's going to take you too long time to realize what they are doing, how they are connected, and how you can uh, just do basic stuff within given the next hour or so. And of course, as I try to uh, also uh, picture you with the pain images that we try to always, you know, run away from the pain and try to find things that are pleasurable. And I think Onyx is a nice way to do it. Hopefully, of course. Onyx out of the box has also nice these additional uh, tools around it. So you can have a, a nice ETL project which you can just configure. So it, it, it will pass data through, uh, for example, Datomic to, uh, to, uh, uh, to your normal database or Elasticsearch. Just check out these projects. There is also Onyx dashboard which you can see what jobs are running, what are their statuses, what are their you know, links behind it. There is also a replica. You can just see how the replicas are doing. What are they? You know what I'm working on. There is an Ansible playbook to deploy the uh, Onyx cluster to a production environment. There is also metric suite that uh, you know you can use the uh, Onyx API to fetch all these metrics and then uh, you know realize, uh, see what these metrics are doing. There is also a benchmark suite that uh, <coughs> even though. I don't think the, the, the raw performance is not the Onyx's first goal. I mean, if you want to have like raw performance, it's probably better to use, for example, like Samza or any kind of like a, uh, technologies that the, the big corporations are using. I think that's what they are focused on. Maybe just even use Hadoop. But I mean, here Onyx's design is much more uh, focused on the fun part and taking really things as simple as simple as possible and then build stuff on top of it and the nice thing is there is also a huge you know yeps and uh, test suite to uh, to actually test what's going on within the onyx because distributed systems are really hard and here's a screenshot from the onyx dashboard it nicely tells you what's the status and what's the job doing and also what kind of like visualizations you have. Let's say you, are, you need to uh, read a million database records. How does the Onyx does that? Uh, the Onyx uh, SQL, for example, uh, plugin uh, lets you specify what's the integer key and distribute uh, partition all the data you have uh, to different peers and do this operation in parallel. Here are the couple of links that uh, you can you you can use. I will definitely suggest you to start with Learn Onyx because it's a nice way, step by step progress to define you or make you understand what's the workflow. Just makes uh, you need to make very small adjustment in the whole code base. You just need to run it. It will work as long as you find the right answer. And then you go to the next one and next one and next one. So you slightly, slowly progress through a full uh, job ontology in the fastest way. Otherwise, you might be get confused within the way. And the last one, the last thing is there is not that much open source projects that are available on GitHub. The nice one is a CQRS implementation using Onyx. It's nice to check it out, you know, once you get, you know, head start with all the, the basic bits and pieces with Onyx, I definitely suggest you to take a look at it. Uh, that's the connection information that I have that I like running. 
And I'd like to thank Michael Drolis a lot. He even, you know, last night in the middle of the night, I asked him, hey, you know, Michael, there's no uh, architecture over your picture. So he just, you know, draw me a picture and send it in the next 15 minutes. These guys are serious to dedicate themselves to, to this project. It's not like a playground project. Right now, as far as I know, Michael is full-time working on Onyx. They are doing consultancy as the site with the Onyx. So it's a nice thing that uh, lots of people I mean, and lots of, at least there are like companies that are paying uh, consultancy fee fees to these people to make uh, Onyx better or to help with their projects. And thanks for using Clojure. That's it. <laughs>